Welcome to the Week of Inspiration, which has certainly lived up to its name this year. It's wonderful to have so many people joining us online once again, or tuning in for the first time this week, eager for a dose of inspiration. Well, you've come to the right place, and just in time, as it's our last lecture of the series. Of course, tomorrow we will cap it off with the DS, the 59th anniversary of the founding of the University of Twente, and hope that you will all join in the online celebration. My name is Jennifer Herrick, and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Science and Technology. I still remember being introduced to the SI units in high school and being enamored by both their ease of use compared to the obscure measurement routinely used in the States, as well as the accompanying intrigue, the platinum artifacts held in a Parisian vault that set the standard. Today, we bring you the story of an epic quest to define and redefine the kilogram, the last standard unit of measure that was, until recently, still defined by a physical artifact. Now, its true value is no longer man-made, but naturally occurring. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce Joachim Ulrich, president of the Physikalis Technische Bundesanstalt, the National Metrology Institute of Germany, and the Consultative Committee on Units. An eminent scientist renowned for his work in quantum physics and free electron lasers, former director of the Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics, and recipient of numerous prizes and awards. Now, I could say that Professor Ulrich will inspire us with a tale of unmeasurable proportions, but that would be an exaggeration, even by American standards. For in the world of metrology, Accurate and reliable measurements are what it's all about. And besides, he only has 30 minutes, plus or minus a few. I look forward to receiving your questions for Professor Ulrich in the chat. And now, may I hand the floor over to Professor Ulrich. Yeah, Jennifer, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Uh, thank you very much for the nice introduction uh, and uh, the invitation to talk about the redefinition of the kilogram, but also a little bit broader, maybe linking the international system of units to fundamental constants. I would have loved to come in person. I've never been in uh, Twente, but I appreciate very much that we can do it uh, this way. Now, let me go a little bit into history. So uh, ancient cultures already knew that some properties of artifacts, substances, and phenomena can really be measured, like, for instance, this height of the pyramid uh, can be expressed, uh, and this is a quantity, namely the height, and it can be expressed in terms of a unit and a value. And the unit at those times, for instance, was always an artifact. It was a cubit, actually. And, uh, and the qubit uh, is very convenient as a, as a standard because you always have it with you, but obviously there's a disadvantage, there are infinitely many. So they had a royal qubit actually, and, uh, and uh, this was very serious because uh, the, um, the working standards had to be recalibrated with a royal qubit once per year, and this was by death penalty. And this is why these pyramids are really very, very exact so they have uh, length measurements, proportions, uh, with an uncertainty of only 10 to minus 4. There are other beautiful uh, examples, Babylonian weights or uh, Chinese volumes, uh, volume units and others. Uh, and uh, yeah, these are all artifacts. And obviously, depending on the, on the, on the unit, uh, you have different values. So if you go to Germany, we have very, very many local governors and reigners. And uh, until the end of 19th century, we had more than 40 different qubits, ranging from something like 50 centimeters to 81 centimeters in Bavaria. So we always had to joke in Germany because in Bavaria everything is larger uh, since, uh, since ever, obviously. And, uh, but what you see is that this is obviously a technical obstacle for trade and manufacturing, and this should be overcome. 
How was uh, the situation in France? There was only one uh, king, maybe better. But no, it was not better. Uh, as you can see here, they had about 250,000 different units in France. Uh, and for lengths, uh, they had, for instance, the Ligne, the Pouce, the Pied, Trois, Parish, and so on and so forth. So, complete disaster. So, uh, at the uh, uh, at 7075 round, uh, the, the idea came up by uh, Condorcet, who was a mathematician, a philosopher, an economist, and a statesman. And he had a dream, and he was uh, dreaming that uh, you should assure that measurements are invariable by making use of a standard borrowed from a natural phenomenon, a universal standard that will allow the adhesion of all nations. So these were uh, the ideas which were around those time. He had to wait a little bit until the French Revolution came, and the revolutionaries took it as into their program, so to say, and their ambition was to uh, create units which are valid for all times and all civilizations, are to le temps, are to le peuple. And they set up a committee which was actually very highly ranked, uh, famous mathematicians, Lagrange, Laplace, Borda, Monge, Condorcet, and they came up with a suggestion that they would like to use uh, a system which is based on the decimal system, and as you can see on the left, they took it very serious, also the day was uh, just divided into 10 hours, uh, and it should be based on the properties of the Earth, because the Earth belongs to every nation, so that should be then valid for all. So, um, and the idea was uh, to measure one quarter of an Earth meridian, and uh, the, the ten thousandth part of that should be then the standard, should be the meter. And two people, namely François Michin and Jean-Baptiste Delambre, they were sent out by, uh, uh, to measure the distance between Dunkirk and Barcelona, both on the sea level, and, uh, and uh, from that then derive uh, what the Earth meridian is and the meter. And this actually, uh, yeah, however, took only two, it was in law for two years, this meter, uh, and then, uh, obviously, the French uh, people, the workers, the French workers were not happy with it, and why wasn't they, weren't they happy? Uh, because at the same day, day one week, had, uh, the same decision, one week had ten working days, and this was not uh, very favorable, so it was abolished very soon, and it had a wait, and another 100 years until uh, the Mida Convention was signed uh, by 17 states as one of the first international organizations. Interestingly, uh, the United, United States were the, among the signatory states, not the, uh, not the British Empire, for instance. Germany was in as well, uh, and others. So, and. Um, and uh, they defined, they took the meter, they took the kilogram, an artifact which came from the French Revolution and which uh, is a weight of one cubic decimeter of water. And later they took the second under the auspices of the astronomers at those times. And so they, what they did is actually what was proposed in the French Revolution, maybe take the properties of our Earth to define standards. Now, at the very same time, 1870, this was questioned by James Clark Maxwell. Uh, he was saying that the definition of units at the time are no two invariants. Since the properties of our, our planet can change, and it would still be our planet, but if the properties of an atom were to be changed, it would no longer be the same atom. So, this was not a good idea, he said, you should take properties of atoms. Uh, but at those times, we didn't understand atoms well enough. Uh, we needed quantum mechanics. And again, essentially, at the same time, quantum mechanics was discovered. And this brings me uh, to Germany, to the Physikalische Technische Reichsanstalt, Imperial, uh, uh, Imperial Institute, which was founded in 1887. Uh, and uh, the first, uh, the first uh, director was Hermann von Helmholtz. It was founded together with industry, with Werner von Siemens, and also together with the Imperial uh, Verification Authority, Wilhelm Förster. And uh, in this area here, um, yeah, and we had uh, a famous curatorium, scientific advisory board, with 40, 40 Nobel Prize winners in there up to the present day. We have three of them, which are here indicated on the right hand side, coming every year. And in this area, actually, quantum mechanics was discovered. 
on the basis of measurements, namely of measurements of black body radiations, uh, radiation which could not be explained. Max Planck was in the curatorium at those times, and the experimentalist called him and said something is wrong. And uh, Max Planck said in an act of uh, despair overnight, he had to postulate that radiation is uh, quantized, and he introduced the famous Planck concept. So all of that was essentially at the same time, but it took us until the present day to really bring that into force. Now, this was a longer introduction, and in my talk, I'm now introducing you to the present International System of Units, ESI, uh, show you how defining constants uh, would uh, define the revised SI, and if there is some time left over, I would like to talk a little bit about the future of time. International System of Units. Uh, it was established, as we know it now, in 1960 by the General Conference of the Media Convention, and it consists of the quantities, length, mass, time, electric current, temperature, amount of substance, and luminous intensity. So these are our base units. Uh, we have names for them and symbols. We have names for the quantities. Uh, we have derived units, uh, like for the velocity, meter per second, or for the concentration, mole per cubic meter. We have actually derived units with special names, uh, like uh, for the frequency we have the hertz, for the force we have the newton. And we have dimensions of quantities, so we can do dimensional quantity uh, calculation. Um, all of that together forms a set of coherent SI units. This means you need no conversion factors. And with these units, you can essentially measure everything which is of any scientific or economical interest. It is a global measurement infrastructure. You can measure the intensity of the light from an LED, the CO2 concentration in the air, creatinine concentration in blood serum, and so on and so forth. Whatever you would like to measure, this is possible with this uh, system. It's valid worldwide, so nowadays we have actually 102 member and associated states in the organization, international organization, designated institutes, and so on, and all together they form uh, about 98% of the world's economic power. So the uh, SI presently is a basis and condition sine qua non for global trade, uh, it is a cornerstone of international, what we call, quality infrastructure. And part of this infrastructure, quality infrastructure, for instance, to give you some, some idea, uh, worldwide about 65,000 laboratories, um, which uh, are certified along a certain norm, ISO IEC 70025. And this requests for these laboratories that all their measurements are traceable to the SI. So we have a worldwide system, a currency over the world for measurement system, for measurement standards, and we thus uh, can, uh, can, uh, can guarantee quality worldwide. Now, uh, let me come back to a few fundamentals. As I said before, you have a value of a quantity, and this can ex be expressed as a number and a unit, like the mass is 10 kilogram, and up to recently the kilogram was just an artifact, as I said before. Uh, the time is measured by seconds, 55.4 seconds, for instance, and you can now go to, into atoms and look for frequencies in atoms. So essentially, this is a little pendulum which is oscillating in an atom, uh, and this particular pendulum, in cesium-133, is oscillating more than 9 billion times per second. So whenever you measure, you have to quote an uncertainty, because you can never measure with infinite uh, also with, 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 with no uncertainty, this is not possible. But if, since this part here is a constant of a nature, this transition is a cesium atom, you can go another way, you can just skip the uncertainty and define the second by fixing the numerical value of this little pendulum and say that exactly 9,192,631,770 oscillation of this little pendulum in this atom is just one second. And this is exactly the idea of Maxwell, take the properties of atoms. And this is what we did uh, in uh, 1967 already, so this is the definition for the second. When we defined the second like that, we could realize it with an uncertainty of 10 to the minus 14. 
Uh, nowadays, uh, we can realize it with a uh, hundred times improved uh, uh, uncertainty, maybe 10 to the minus 16. So this is just one second in 160 million years uncertainty. And actually, we need that for GPS, for satellite na navigation, and so on. So what you see here, however, is by such a kind of a definition, you, and you can improve uh, the realization accuracy without changing the definition. And this is why the International uh, Committee has done that also for the lengths, where we fix the numerical value of the speed of light and define a meter by the travel time, so to say, uh, the uh, light needs uh, to overcome the distance of one meter. And again, this is extremely far-reaching. We have now different possibilities to realize the meter and can measure, for instance, just by travel time measurement of a laser, the distance from here to the moon, but we can also measure all the small distances uh, down to micrometer, nanometer, and even to picometer. And again, our accuracy is only limited by our technical abilities, not by the definition. Now, and this is very different for the kilo, which still was an artifact until recently. And now, uh, maybe you can play in this little uh, movie. This artifact actually was sitting in Paris, in Sèvres, still sitting there. In a, in a safe. Uh, the International Committee once in a year looked into this cabinet and had to make sure that the, that the kilogram was still there. And I was, uh, for, for some years, one member of this committee and had the pleasure to, uh, to uh, take part in this ceremony. Okay, because, why? Because it's very important. The, the, all mass measurement in the world just depended on this piece. And it, you have to make sure that it's still there and nothing happened. Now, since this is so important, uh, it was only taken out of its cabinet three times in its life since more than 100 years and compared to his own copies and to national copies. And what you see then from this comparison that there was a discrepancy over the years being building up. So uh, about 50 microgram per kilogram, not so much, but nevertheless, uh, by definition, the international prototype is always a kilogram. Um, but you don't know whether it has been moving. Uh, and, uh, and if it has been moved, uh, the whole universe would change its mass, essentially. It would always be one kilogram. So this is not a, a satisfactory situation. And also what you can see here, by such a definition, we can never get any better, because the artifact itself, its properties, define what our, our final uh, accuracy is in the realization. So this is, not, uh, this is not a nice situation. It's even more not nice, because the uh, definition, the unit of mass goes into the de definition for the units of the candela, of the luminous intensity for the, cap, for the mole, and for the old definition of the electric current. So we had a situation where we are not happy about five of these definitions from seven. And uh, at the same time, we saw that we have tremendous benefits uh, using quantum-based units, and actually also the electric units were, in 1990, redefined in terms of uh, quantum uh, phenomena. Now, the question was, uh, can we build up a coherent system uh, that is based on, uh, on the quantum uh, nature of our, of our universe. And actually, again, this is a very old idea by Max Planck. When he postulated the, the, the Planck constant, uh, in 1900, he wrote a paper in German at those times, which I'll translate for you. At the end of his paper, he thought about units. And he said, with the help of fundamental constants, we have the, we have the uh, possibility of establishing units of length, time, mass, and temperature, which necessarily retain their validity for all times in civilization, even extraterrestrial and non-human. So he had even a larger vision, say, uh, than, the, than the French revolutionists, uh, and he was concentrated on fundamental constant. And he defined the so-called Planck constants, which we use up to the present day in high energy physics to define our present limits of knowledge. So he used the Planck constant, the, the gravitational constant, the speed of light, and the Boltzmann constant to define these units. And as you can see, they are not very practical. If you look on the, on the, on the, on the, 
on the Planck uh, time, for instance, this is one unit would be 10 to the minus 44 seconds, so this is not really practical. So we had to go a little bit a different way, and I would come to that uh, very much at the end of one. Now, what we did, however, is essentially going his way. So we fixed the numerical value of defining constants, of fundamental constants, the speed of light, the Planck constant, the electron charge, the Boltzmann constant, Avogadro constant, and by using the equation of physics, we then can realize the units. And this is indeed for all times and uh, civilizations, as far as we know. Now, um, it's, and it's also valid uh, throughout uh, the entire universe, maybe not in the black hole, maybe not at the really border, at the limits of the, of the universe, where we don't understand what's going on. Now, but everywhere where we understand, it's valid, and so it's actually ex extension, extending uh, the vision of the French Revolution now for even into the entire universe. Yes, uh, this system now is uh, a cohes consist consistent and a coherent set, and it's based on our present understanding of nature. Uh, it has many, many advantages, actually. Uh, it is fundamentally improved as compared to before. It guarantees long-term uh, stability because uh, we have fixed these constants and they cannot change, they cannot be scratched or so, like a kilogram, piece of kilogram. Uh, nothing happens here. It's mostly defining uh, um, a set of defining constants which we need uh, to establish the units in general for the Kelvin, for the Candela, and for the kilogram. Now I come to the kilogram. So for the kilogram, we have actually now for macroscopic uh, uh, masses, we have two different ways to realize the kilogram by using this fundamental constant. They are very diff different, and so we can compare it and make sure that everything is correct. Uh, the one is a silicon crystal method, and the other one is a so-called watt balance. And uh, due to the time restriction, I unfortunately have no time to talk about the watt balance, so I will concentrate on the silicon crystal method. This uh, actually is a large collaboration, the Avogadro collaboration, and PDB is part of it. And uh, the idea here is that you count the number of atoms in a crystal sphere of enriched silicon 28. Uh, and here is the equation, how get you, do you get the mass? First of all, you see there is a mass and the Planck constant is involved. This looks a little bit difficult, but it's very easy to explain. I would try that. Uh, so the first term is nothing more than the number of atoms. We have the volume of the sphere, and we have the so-called lattice constant. So uh, the uh, atoms are arranged in a regular crystal lattice in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this silicon sphere, and we have eight atoms in one unit cell with the side lengths of A. So in the uh, equation above, you say C A cubed, so this is a little volume of one yeah, a beer case, say, and we know that there are eight uh, atoms in there, and so we only need to uh, know the total volume, and then we have the number of atoms. It's a little bit like uh, counting, so to say, the number of beer bottles, if you know how much is in the case, and if you know the volume of the entire uh, container, so to say. Very similar. Now, um, now we have the number of atoms, we have no mass. And the mass we get from basic quantum mechanics. Uh, and the next term here is just the electron mass as you learn it in your first semester quantum, uh, quantum physics uh, from the hydrogen atom. And uh, you have some other constants which we need here. So we have the Planck constants, uh, which is fixed uh, numerical values, uh, the speed of light as well. Then we need the fine structure constant, which we know very well, and we need uh, the Rydberg constant, which we also know very well. So what we now have is the number of atoms and electron mass. And now we have to relate the electron mass to the mass of a typical atom in this uh, sphere, and this is a relative measurement or mass measurement or isotope mass measurement, which we can do with high precision. So this, uh, by this way, you can uh, provide the primary realization of the kilogram. Now, uh, there are many, many challenges, and I cannot go into too much detail. One of the challenges is actually to measure the volume. So you see here the sphere in a very spherical interferometer, and we measure a hundred thousands of diameters, and finally we get a topology of the sphere, of the surface. And you see uh, uh, red and blue, this is, uh, this is mountains and valleys on this sphere, and the deviation is just, in this case, 35 millimeters. Actually, here you see, after polishing, 
uh, the crystalline structure still coming out, so to say. We can do it that better. We have random walk uh, polishing and get down to 16 nanometers peak to valley. Uh, and this is actually the roundest object which we have in the world, possibly in the universe. Just to make uh, it clear by a comparison, if you would, uh, it's, uh, if you would uh, scale it to the size of the Earth, then uh, the highest uh, difference between peak to valley, between mountain to valley in the deep sea, would just be two meters, and we measure that with an accuracy of a few millimeters. So uh, over thousands of kilometers, say, on the Earth, which would be actually very boring. No skiing, nothing. Uh, unfortunately, uh, fortunately, it's not like that. Nevertheless, uh, this is very challenging. It's the most advanced length interferometers uh, which we need here. We need the most advanced surface technologies. You could imagine that we have to control the surface extremely well. And we need the most precise measurement in chemistry, which is just the isotope distribution in this, uh, in this, in this sphere. So there is a huge uh, technological challenge and there is a lot of innovative techniques involved uh, to come, so to say, from a yeah, piece of artifacts uh, which have been developed until the French Revolution to finally a quantum-based uh, representation of the kilogram. Yeah, um, so we have different realization. So things are now much safer. There's less co uh, correlation. We can do comparisons between these different measurements. The realization can actually be done everywhere in the world. We can in the universe, actually. We don't need to travel to Paris every time to recalibrate our kilogram. We can do it in our laboratory. Uh, and also, a very uh, further um, um, yeah, uh, improvement is that uh, we can actually uh, now not only realize uh, the kilogram at one point, at one kilogram, we can realize it essentially throughout the entire scale. We can shrink the size of this, uh, of this silicon sphere. We can even go down to nanoparticles, which are very well defined. And here uh, we see the present uh, calibration uncertainty, which we provide for small masses. And you see, the further you go away from one kilogram, the worse it becomes. And in future, this blue line, if we have these silicon nano uh, crystals, we can actually small uh, masses, we can uh, realize with much higher accuracy. And this is true for many of the other quantities as well. Now, um, the further advantage is that the electrical units uh, are back in the SI again. For the electrical units, they're very easy to understand. We define uh, the unit of, uh, of the, 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 the charge of the electron. This is a quantized uh, carrier of charge. Uh, and now we only need to count electrons. This sounds simple, but technologically it's very difficult actually. And what you see here is, that uh, we have a single electron pump realized on a, on a quantum dot, uh, on a chip, so to say. We switch this potential and we feed through one electron after the other, and by that we realize the ampere in the new system. Um, for the electrical units, you see that base units are only a convention, because using uh, the Planck constant and the electron charge, you can actually directly realize the quantized uh, uh, resistance, the quantum hole, hall effect, by the quantum hall effect, and you can directly also realize the quantized voltage uh, by the von Klitze, by the Josephson constant. Now, base units are only a convention. Uh, obviously, you can even go easier. You can just count electrons and realize the charge if you if that is techno technologically uh, meaningful. Now, what you see here is. Uh, that this kind of definitions open a lot of yeah, possibilities for innovation in research and industry, because now you can take essentially every equation which is around to realize the units and which, are, which is fit for purpose. And uh, so we have different new upcoming in innovative technologies like commercial bot panels, like uh, yeah, primary thermometer based on noise in resistors, single electron tunneling devices, as I have said before, or a quantum hall effect based on graphene or even on topological insulators. So a lot of possibilities for innovation. Very importantly, as I said at the beginning, so the, uh, the, the accuracy of the realization is not dependent on the definition anymore. So whenever you do a better experiment, you get a better realization. 
So in this case, for instance, for this single electron pump, we have now at PDB the best uh, realization of the ampere in the world for small currents in the order of 10 to the minus 7. However, uh, if you would be able to really count each single electron, you could realize the ampere with an accuracy of 10 to the minus 19. Uh, so we are only limited by the quantum nature of, uh, of our universe. We are not limited by the definition. And this, again, opens everything to innovation. So I hope I have convinced you that uh, this system provides us a lot of benefits. But we have to make sure, for, so, so it's a huge change, but we have to make sure that there is no change in all of these um, laboratories worldwide, 65,000. Uh, they don't want to recalibrate. So in order to, to do that like that, uh, we had to ensure that uh, the system, the old system, goes really into the new system. And this we did by measuring with high accuracy all the fundamental data uh, constants which we need for the revised system. In the old system, we're measured with very high accuracy, like the electron charge, uh, the uh, Boltzmann constant, the Avogadro constant, and the Planck constant on the level of 10 to minus 7 to 10 to minus 9. And this was sufficient uh, to go for redefinition. So this was fine. Uh, this was actually already in 2017. So in 2018, then, uh, we could go ahead and redefine the entire system of, uh, of the SI uh, now by fixing the numerical values of these constants, as you see them here. Uh, this is now graved in stone. You can also have it as a business card always with you. So this little business card, card is from NIST, actually. And uh, the new system guarantees long time stability, realization everywhere in the world, with ever increasing accuracy as technology proceeds, and it triggers innovation in science, industry, and technology. A huge achievement. So, if you, I, I, I think I have another three minutes or so. Um, I would uh, ask Max Planck again whether he would be happy with such a definition, and he probably would say yes. Oh, so sorry, um, maybe here uh, again. So this was defied, we decided then uh, in 2018 in a historic event uh, in Versailles. Uh, and, um, and we had two Nobel laureates, Bill Phillips and, uh, and uh, Klaus von Klitzing, giving speeches. Uh, it was a very emotional moment, actually, when all countries, member countries, uh, agreed. And you see they all have smiles on their faces. So I think this is a great example how science, how metrology uh, can work towards international collaboration. So international collaboration is demonstrated that it can work and it has to work, I think, uh, to get all the challenges uh, of the future under control. And I think this is very optimistic. Now, um, in Germany, we introduced it, then finally in 2020, when it, 19, when it came into operation, actually, and we have a little exhibition in the German uh, uh, museum in, uh, in Munich. Now, um, I hope I have another two minutes or so, uh, Jennifer. Yes, um, you can now ask uh, Max Planck whether he would be happy with that, and he would say yes. Basically, yes, but the second. Uh, that is not a fundamental constant. This is just a transition in a certain atom somewhere. You could take another atom. So, and indeed, this is why probably we have to redefine the second at some point. Why? Now, in the past, and this is talking about the future of time now, and uh, as I'm going to show you, time is also gravitational dependent, not so strongly as here shown by Salvador Dali, but uh, anyhow. Uh, we'll come to that in a minute. Um, nowadays, actually, we have traps and, uh, and methods where we can use a pendulum in atoms, which is oscillating much faster, 100,000 times faster. These are so-called optical transitions, for instance, in the, the terpium ion, which is trapped in this trap. And here, we can now reach a systematic uncertainty in the order of n minus 18. This is 100 times better than what we have with the SI second. There are about five labs in the world which are, who are on that level. So what, what happens in the future? So what you see here is the relative uncertainty of the SI second over the years. And as I said before, this has improved for, from some 10 to minus 14 to 10 to the minus 16 nowadays. Now with this 
faster transitions, uh, 500 terahertz, uh, this came around uh, at uh, about at 1990 or so, and you see the development is much steeper. And this steep development continues, and now we are at 2020, uh, at 10 minus 18, and I recently heard a talk of one of the best clock maker makers in the world, uh, from Junier in this, and he was very confident uh, that uh, in reasonable time, we will see a relative accuracy of 10 to the minus 21 which is uh, enormous, even 10 minus 18 is, is huge. And then you can, and already now with 10 minus 18, uh, these clocks are not only clocks, but they are very, very sensitive detectors. You can detect, for instance, dark matter. You can detect gravitational waves. Both has been demonstrated. Uh, you can do geodesy. And at 1 times 10 to the minus 18 is just the height difference in the gravitational field of the Earth of only 1 centimeter. So you can exactly see the potential below you. You can see water streams, you can see, um, you can see whether there is ice, and so on and so forth. And you can test uh, basic uh, invariances with uh, so far unprecedented accuracy. And again, there are beautiful examples already now. So when should this be redefined? We don't know at the moment. There's a roadmap. Um, at the end of the day, um, only the time will show. Only time will tell us when we will redefine. That depends now. There are different methods. They still have to be compared and so on. But it's very clear that maybe in the next four to eight years or so, maybe 10 years, uh, that the second will be redefined, uh, even to get this even larger uh, or, or smaller uncertainty. And now I'm really at the end. I think uh, we have approached now the most abstract uh, definition of units you could think of, and the most stable one, the most universal one. Uh, and this is a huge achievement, I think, of mankind. It's a huge achievement that all nations in the world are agreeing to use the system, and it's based on the achievements of really very, very prominent uh, scientists which are shown here, Avogadro, Reinhold Schmatzblank, Josephson, and uh, Klaus von Glitzing. And when I talk to Klaus von Glitzing, he always says he is one of the two uh, constants, uh, living constants, uh, together with Josephson. Uh, both of them uh, yeah, have their own constant, that is the von Glitzing and the Josephson constant. And uh, nevertheless, this is based on the, on the work of, of thousands of physicists and uh, over many, many centuries, and among them very prominent ones. And, uh, I think a huge achievement, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ulrich, for this fantastic lecture. Um, I'd, I'd like to uh, applause on behalf of all of, all of uh, our, our online audience. Questions have been streaming in. Maybe in, in order to facilitate that, if you could manage to stop sharing your screen so we could see uh, you yes, a little I, better. I, I try it. Thank you. Um, as I said, we've got lots of questions, and they range from, I think, simple ones, for you at least, uh, more, more physical in nature, uh -huh. as well as some that are much more philosophical. So um, I think I'll start with the easy ones. <laughs> well, I don't know how easy they are. Yeah, yeah, sometimes the easy questions are the most challenging ones. Indeed, <laughs> indeed. Okay, this one maybe indeed uh, relates on what you just showed in the last slide. You talked about um, other constants, uh, from, uh, from Klitzing or from uh, Josephson, for example. Joshua wonders that if we are able to find new fundamental constants, um, will, will this affect how SI units are going to be defined? Um, no, we, we don't think so. So the first question would be, what is a fundamental question? And there's uh, a lot of discussion about that. We had a scientific seminar on that with world experts, and uh, there was no agreement uh, what a fundamental constant really is. Okay. So typically, it is a constant which is in theory, uh, and uh, which is not uh, which which occurs in theory, but uh, which not doesn't the, the value doesn't come out of theory. So you have to measure it. Okay. And, uh, well, that's and, a, a very uh, nice uh, link to my next uh, my, my next question, actually, yeah. um, if I if I may continue, um, which sure. which talks about measurements. Is there really absolute agreement on the way to make these measurements, or can we expect that values will change when the measurements improve? I think you touched on this a little bit. Uh, yes, uh, uh, this could happen. 
Uh, say we have these different uh, two different methods for realizing the kilogram, namely the mass, uh, the, the, the the Avogadro uh, experiment and the and the uh, um, balance. Uh, there are very different um, yeah physical principles behind them. And if you now think that we improve uh, yeah the um, accuracy of these two experiments by say two, three, four orders of magnitude, maybe in the future, then we might observe that there is a systematic difference between the two methods. Mm. And that would now uh, tell us that the equations uh, which are based uh, behind that, uh, that they are not correct. So, and so if we have to improve our physical picture with this new system now, we would see that in the realis realization of the units. Mm. Uh, before, the units uh, uh, were de 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 defined independently and we would see it in the equation, but now we see it in the units. Uh, but uh, we, we, we are very sure that in the next time this wouldn't really happen uh, because uh, even for all practical reasons, we are far ahead with accuracy uh, what is usually needed in industry and in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in the calibration laboratories. So even if that would happen, practically it would have no influence in the moment. Now, uh, well, that's a very nice lead-in following up on Leon's question. Daniel asks... Will there be a limit to the accuracy that we can achieve, even with the most cutting-edge technologies to improve accuracy? Will there be a limit? Yeah, what I said, I think uh, there will be a limit, and this is under discussion as well. I think there is a limit, uh, at least on all the quantities where we know that they are quantized. Uh, so uh, if you measure the current, the electric current, uh, mm -hmm. the smallest unit of the current, basically, at least, if you don't go to quasi-particles, <laughs> mm -hmm. is one electron. And this would limit uh, the accuracy of uh, measuring or realizing one ampere to 10 to minus 19. Uh, but nevertheless, you could think now on quasi particles, quasi charges, third, uh, also uh, quark uh, uh, charges. So mm -hmm. there might be even possibilities to go beyond. Uh, this is heavily under discussion sometimes, uh, but uh, we are far away from that point. And so I think we don't need to care too much in the moment. Okay, maybe this is related. Um, you'll understand it surely better than I do at this point. But this question comes from Maurice. He says um, that there are theories currently that the electron-proton mass ratio may not be constant over the duration of our universe. Yes. So the question is, does a possible variation of this effect, does a possible variation of this affect the definition of the kilogram as the electron mass is also in there? Uh, yes, um, also... Okay, uh, you, you, we can measure that, for instance, also at PDB by looking at the fine structure constant and on time variations of the time uh, fine structure constant. Uh, this, uh, this, uh, there is also the proton mass to the electron mass in there as an uncertainty. And presently, our best clocks uh, give the best limits for this uncertainty. So uh, the mass of the electron to the mass to the proton does not change by more than a few times 10 to minus 17 per year. The kilogram definition is 10 to minus 8. So even if it would change, uh, uh, change uh, um, the level would be so small that I would think in the next 100 years at least <laughs> we don't need to care. Okay, but still it's uh, interesting to consider. Um, in fact, considering about um, changes through time and uh, through the universe, I have a question of my own, which is triggered by something you said um, about, uh, where is it? Yeah, here. You said that um, in, in, the, in the revised international system of units that these apply yeah, for all civilizations, all times and throughout the universe. That sounds uh, so uh, romantic. But clearly there must be limits, the frontiers of, of the unknown. And you, and you hinted to this as well, maybe not in black holes or at the limits of our understanding. So can you tell us more about those limits? inspire yeah, our, our young scientists uh, for new research yeah. projects. Yeah, yeah no, the, the, the limits are at the point uh, where our physical understanding, our present uh, physical world doesn't not, does not really fit. Uh, and this is essentially about 10 to minus 44 seconds after the Big Bang, mm. or at relatively large masses. So at that point, uh, really, we don't know what's going on. Uh, and our, we know that our, that our physical laws do not hold anymore. So in this sense, also the Planck units uh, yeah, provide us with the limits up to the present day. 
Um, and this is used by high energy physicists. So what is beyond that point, we don't know at the moment. And th there are many experiments going on. For instance, uh, looking on time variations of the of the time structure constant, we don't know what uh, what uh, what uh, dark matter is. We don't know what dark energy is. So there's a lot to find out for the young people. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, maybe we'll uh, bring back to uh, to uh, to uh, reality to the moment, and um, I want to switch gears a little bit with some of the questions um, in in terms of the tone. Maybe uh, getting also a bit more personal with you. You were there, I believe, in Paris. I didn't, I didn't uh, catch you in the film, but um, I believe you were there in Paris um, when the artifact was shown. Um, the question is, what did you do exactly? Alida asked this question. What did you do? Was it just there to see it, or? Um... Yes, actually, uh, when, the, when the film was taken, I was not there. Uh, <laughs> so this, were not, this was not the real committee, so these were just uh, um, actors. Ah. Uh, but yes, but yes, uh, the committee meets uh, two times a year, and once per year, uh, at least up to now, they were obliged to go down in the cellar to look in the cabinet and just to make sure that it is still there. There are three keys, actually. Oh. Uh, one is uh, with the director of the, uh, of the BIPM, of the Bureau of the International Standards there. Uh, another one is with the president of the CIPM, and, uh, and the third one is with the head of the Academy de France. So. Uh, so, and these three keys have to come together once per year, and we look whether this thing is still, still around. Yes, there's no, not more. Okay, we have a, a large meeting, uh, many decisions uh, before. But did you get? Did you take a, a selfie with it? Sure. Did you take a Pardon? selfie? Did you take a selfie with it or anything? Um, uh, just... Uh, no, I have no selfie. For you. you can take a photograph, but uh, selfie, I, yeah. unfortunately, I don't have. <laughs> yes, a pity. Um, Alida also continues, and, and uh, she's not the only one. Peter also wonders, what has happened to Le Grand K? Is it now in a museum? Is it still in the vault? Oh, it's still, uh, it's still in Sable, in this little cabinet. <laughs> Uh, and uh, there's no final decision what happens. Uh, problem, most likely it stays there. Uh, there are many visitors coming and being uh, are very delighted to see uh, the, the international prototype of the kilogram, of the meter as well. So there's a little kind of museum uh, and people are invited to go there and, and, and have a look at it. Now, okay. Plan that for uh, post-corona times, our next vacation. <laughs> um, all right, uh, here's another question for you. Um, this one um, comes from also Elida. She says, in the field of science and trade, these standards are very important. But what about in your personal life or in my personal life or in Elida's personal life? Does it really matter that you know what a minute is or a kilo is exactly? No, I think it does matter. Huh? Um, also, what a minute is. Uh, if you if you use your handy with your GPS system, uh, you need to know the uh, time on the level of ten minus fourteen fifteen. Otherwise, uh, your GPS would be quite wrong. Mm. So uh, you use it every day, and I think it's quite useful to use it. Uh, if you buy a ring with a certain carat of gold, uh, you also would like to know how much you bought. I think. Huh? And they are extremely, uh, very, very uh, expensive pharmaceutics, actually, with very small masses, uh, where, where even milligram are billions of euro. So, um, so I think it is, uh, it, it is also important for you. And you want to make sure, if you go to the, to the supermarket and you buy a kilogram, you would like to know that it's a kilogram. That's not half a kilogram, or say 20% less or so. And this is ensured by this quality infrastructure which we have. This is ensured by the verification offices, which you have as well in your country, we have in Germany. So they go there and calibrate the, 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 the gauge in the supermarket, or the balance in the supermarket, uh, and make sure that you get what you pay. So I think it's uh, really important. And actually, uh, when I was in, uh, in Peru, I saw um, the gas station uh, where they said that uh, in this case, a gas station, you can, can be sure that the measurement is correct. <laughs> Others, obviously not. <laughs>
But Joachim, I can tell you that, um, okay, I, I haven't been there for a while, but I, uh, uh, every time I go to a grocery store in the United States um, and, and weigh my vegetables, yeah, I'm, 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 uh, I weigh a half a pound of, uh, of strawberries. Um, uh, yeah. so, so indeed, um, there are still a lot of uh, cultural differences in terms, of, in, in terms of measurements that are very hard, hard to change. Um, do you, do you, is that something also that, that, um, that also the, 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 the international community is, try, is, is, is trying to promote more standardization and more also um, acceptance? Yes, so there, there are two different, uh, I think, areas. One is public area in the supermarket in, in the country. The other one is international trade. Uh, and as I said before, in the uh, United States, for instance, uh, also Great Britain, there are members of the, of, or at least the United States, there are members of the media convention since the very beginning. So all in, uh, in, in, in official trade, uh, the SI is the basis also for US trade internationally. Uh, and internally, they have just conversion factors. Uh, sometimes it's very hard uh, to go away from these traditional uh, yeah, standards, which is okay. It's just another complication. And sometimes it's actually also dangerous. No? If you fuel your, your airplane uh, with gallons instead of liters, and this happened actually once in a while, so it can be dangerous, it's an obstacle. Uh, but it's no basic problem because you have fixed conversion systems, uh, uh, conversion factors, and uh, and the agreed system is ESI for all of the countries. Yeah, yeah. But I think you, you and me both. You said in the beginning of your talk that in uh, in, Bavar in Bavaria everything is is larger. In the United States, also there's a tendency to uh, to supersize things, right? Um, <laughs> But um, perhaps we can uh, we can both work on um, promoting um, promoting more acceptance to a uh, because yeah it, it, it's so it's also a way of, of creating um, yeah a more global global connected community that we have right yes definitely and as I said I think in this sense uh, the media convention over the many years over more than hundred years really played uh, an essential role now, this is really a big cultural achievement yes. that all the yes. countries in the world really agree on one currency for standards. Uh, yes. If you think about economics or so, yes. this is much more difficult. If you think about politics, even more difficult. Uh, but at least the scientists, uh, they can show how it could work <laughs> in a good world. Okay, I have another question, which, which might just be trivia, but it's been, it's been bugging me. Why is, is uh, of, of the seven base units now of the mm. revised system, um, one of them, the kilogram, as we're talking about mostly today, yeah, why is there a prefix in, in, the, in the base unit? Why do we not consider just the gram? Uh, why a kilogram? Yeah, this is, uh, this, uh, is also tradition. It's simply tradition. Uh, you're completely right. I mean, uh, the point is, as you, as you said before, uh, a standard system is never th something which comes out of pure science. Uh, if we just would use pure science, we would probably come to, we would certainly come to a more a simpler system, yeah? and we would not uh, define a kilogram. Uh, nevertheless, it comes from practical purposes, uh, and it emerges from practical pur purposes. And so we we are not so we are not so yeah strict on these things. Yeah? We we take it as it is. We we accept that there are people. And that people would like to handle it, and that people have been used to that kilogram now since many, many years, and also to other things. So we, we just accept that. We, we are working towards better things. And we make sure, however, and this is very important, that what we do is scientifically sound. Uh, this is the important part. So if you really go to the core, it, it is correct. Everything is based on our present understanding of physics and chemistry uh, on, 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 on highest level. Uh, and all the other little yeah, uh, cultural things, uh, we, we, are, we are just accepting. <laughs> hmm. All right. Um, I, uh, I wonder what's next. I mean, uh, it must have been um, quite uh, yeah, a climax in your career to, 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 uh, to, to get to this point as well um, for you and for many others. But... Um, <laughs> Does the does the does uh, I forget what it's called now the um, 
the committee, the consultative committee on units. Um, um, do you still meet regularly? Um, do you have um, a new, um, yeah, a, a new goal on the horizon? What's next? Uh, yeah, the, the next big goal is a redefinition of the second, uh, for sure. And, uh, and the other challenge, in our opinion, and this now emerges in the committee, is uh, digitization. Um, so uh, what we are now working on is actually an agreed metadata format for all measurement data based on SI worldwide. Uh, for all the standardization organizations, uh, for the accreditation organizations, for all uh, science as well, so that all data which are measured somehow in the SI has the same metadata format so that you can use them in any kind of algorithms for artificial intelligence uh, so that everything is comparable and usable, fair, the fair principles in metrology and in, uh, in, in measurement technique. This is our next big goal, and I think this would be a huge step forward into the digital world uh, if we could agree, uh, and, and I hope maybe that uh, in the next uh, uh, general conference, taking place out every four years, uh, and this will be 2022, uh, that we make the first step towards such a uh, yeah, standardized metadata format for measurement data, and I think this would be something as important in our present world as the definition of the kilogram uh, more than 100 years ago. Because these are the standards of the future, actually, the, uh -huh. uh, the digitized standards. Uh -huh. uh, and this is what we're aiming at in the moment. The standards of the future. So that yeah, has to do the with... Of the future, no? Data. <laughs> data. Data, right? But um, but what what do you expect? I mean, will will there be multiple standards that will define our data? Um, will uh... yeah? Uh, in the moment, yes. Uh, if you if you look in the different countries, uh, also if you look even in different companies, uh, they have different ways how they express uh, in in uh, other. They have di uh, different digital expressions of their units. Uh, and sometimes it's not SI, in the US it's quite often, as you said, inch or, or pounds or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, however, for international trade and also for international standards, it would be important uh, that everybody agrees on one standard how to express measurement data. And this should be based on the SI, and if we accept the SI, which everybody does, we should also agree on, a, on, a, on the same, using the same metadata format, so that uh, if any company somewhere or a calibration laboratory in, in Brazil uh, has a certificate, I can directly take that, put it into machines, uh, and they can read it immediately, yeah? uh, which is not the case presently, mm -hmm. because it's paper and blah, blah, blah. You don't want to have that. You want to have the calibration directly in the machine, in the sensor, in, a, in industry 4.0. Uh, so all of these sensors should be connected to their certificates electronically, and in order to, to come to this goal, uh, this electronic or this digital representation of the units must be the same everywhere. Mm -hmm. and this is what we are aiming at. Now, mm -hmm. yeah. what are the goals? So there, there are many others, actually. Huh? Uh, as I said, uh, there's a lot of innovation going on at the moment, because you can now take any equation which is suitable to realize the unit. Uh, and uh, people are very innovative, uh, and they come up with new realizations of units. We have to test them, we have to make sure that, uh, that, that they are worldwide agreeing and things like that. So, uh, so there's still, uh, so the, the, the base, uh, the bottom line of work is essentially the same. Uh, we but have are, to make sure that all, yeah? Are you, are you speaking then still of, of the derived units that, that still are, are, are based on existing um, base units or? Uh, um, what we have to make sure is uh, that, um, that the kilogram, which we realize here in Germany, is the same one uh, or the nanogram as in Brazil or somewhere else. Ah. Uh, and in order to, to ensure that, you have to make comparisons. Uh, so what we do in the moment, the huge system actually, what we do in the moment is, every NMI, National Metrology Institute of a, of a nation, uh, they uh, have their standards, and we all the time compare them for pressure, for temperature, and so on. We compare whether these realizations on the highest level are identical. Mm -hmm. And then in Germany, for instance, we then uh, yeah, transfer our standard to calibration laboratories. These are 500 in Germany. 
And by that, we make sure that these calibration laboratories, if they claim an uncertainty on the mass, on the temperature, on the pressure, on anything, then this claimed uncertainty is comparable to a claimed uncertainty in Brazil, in India, in China, and so on, uh, with a similar laboratory, because there are related to their National Metrology Institute, and we both, our two National Metrology Institutes, are in agreement. But why so not why not correlated measurements, large scale? Pardon? Why not correlated measurements, large scale? Um, uh, could we imagine designing an experiment, for example, that would be able to uh, look at the uh, interferometric relation uh, between uh, between measurements over la over large distances? Um, what, 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 what we really do is sometimes uh, to exchange uh, measurement standards and uh, uh -huh. over large distances, sometimes really a piece of metal is still transferred to make things comparable. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, so we have to make sure that we, we can realize in, in any lab in the world now, yeah? but we have to make sure that you do not do a mistake in your measurement. I see. Uh, it, it doesn't, it, uh, you, you can still be wrong. And so what we do indeed is to compare that, the work balance in our method, there is a piece of metal really <laughs> being sent around <laughs> and make sure that our measurement is correct. Yeah. <laughs> that they agree. Yeah? And this is done with temperature, this is done with everything. Otherwise, we could not ensure a worldwide, world-spanning system uh, where everything is, is calibrated to each other. Now, uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to have to stop this uh, fascinating discussion with you here. Thank you very much for taking us on this journey with uh, so many different um, perspective, perspectives and, and insights. Um, it really was a fantastic way to, for us to uh, conclude our Week of Inspiration series of lectures. Thank you so much for joining us, Professor Ulrich. Thank you for everyone uh, tuning in online and contributing to the chat. And, well, we hope to see you still tomorrow joining us for the capstone of the week, the celebration of the Dies Natalis of the University of Twente. Thank you. Goodbye.